Well, good morning, everybody. And, and um, essentially today what we're going to do is to get a little deeper into this idea of uh, inventories and some of the statistics that accompany them and then begin exploring these ideas of completeness and gaps and things like that. Um, so first of all, I'll just give you a bit of an overview, just, just some, some basic thinking about, about assembling inventories and specifically these, this idea of regional uh, diagnoses. And so maybe we could take as a goal that of providing a comprehensive view of the distribution and diversity of a major taxon across a country or region. Okay, so some area of interest, something that, that some taxon that is diverse enough to, um, to be of importance and some region that is diverse enough to be kind of more than a single site. And essentially all I wanna do in this talk is, is lay out for you some, some sources of this information. Um, because really, as, as Arturo mentioned, you know, time is unidirectional, and so either the information exists or not. And particularly if you want uh, a view of your region and your taxon that goes back far enough that it can include uh, historical distributions. Either the information exists or it doesn't. So essentially we can explore four broad categories of sources of information. We can work directly from kind of old specimens in museums, in some cases new specimens in museums. Um, I'm gonna do this out of order, but we can go to GBIF, go to VertNet, go to uh, South, South Africa's facilities, go to SpeciesLink and download data. With Rodrigue's project we saw um, de novo data collection. And then one that I'll throw in just out of interest is the idea of existing monographs. And uh, Dorothy and Moses and I were talking about this last night a bit. Um, so I just want to give you kind of a, a broad overview just of this idea, just kind of to introduce the, the day and give you some, some um, examples and some illustrations of these four approaches. And then as we, as we talked about yesterday, quality control is everything, okay? Either you have the quality control done well or you fall into this world of garbage in and garbage out. Okay, so kind of the, the ultimate in terms of documentation of biodiversity is specimens. And the beauty of specimens is that you can um, go back to them and you can check them and you can reinterpret them. And you know, they can be frustrating in that you know, you'll get old data labels like this that really don't have much information on them, okay? But if you consider that that might have been 150 years ago, maybe that's pretty impressive. Um, you know, I always forget that when I'm looking at older specimens, sometimes those specimens predate Darwin, or at least Darwin's publication of The Origin of Species. It's not at all uncommon to be working in the bird world with specimens from the 1850s. Um, but this is just some illustrations of, of bird specimens, kind of close up to give you an idea of what our labels look like. It's not as bad as insect specimens, but you know, we'll frequently have a couple different labels tied to a specimen, and there are all sorts of customs and, and formalities about what kind of labels get put on what kind of specimens and how they are written. This is a collection in Los Angeles and I found that picture on the web. A colleague of mine, John McCormick, and the group that both of us did our dissertations on, which are the New World Jays. And then this picture is just spectacular. This is the US National Museum collection, the Smithsonian collection. 
And this woman now was Roxy Laybourne. She was a forensic ornithologist. So her job was to identify bird parts, usually feathers, from anywhere, usually from criminal investigations. Um, and back when she was working, it was not just the specimens out in the collection, which is about you know, 85 or 90% of the bird species on Earth, but also her own personal files of feathers from thousands of birds. And so they took this picture where they opened essentially every draw in the, in the lower tier of cabinets in the collection. And that's one of, I think it's six rows in that collection. Wow. So it's, it's an amazing collection. So, you know, this really is the ultimate documentation. And the really neat thing about specimens is you can even go back and as species concepts change, you can perhaps do the DNA sequencing and get the full and proper identification. Whereas even the very best, in my world, bird watcher can say, oh yes, I had such and such a species. And you say, oh, but now we recognize two species out of that one. Which one was it? So, so this, is, this is really the ultimate documentation. Um, and I want to give you the idea of, of the depth that you can get. So this is this 25-year project that I mentioned yesterday, uh, the Atlas of the Distribution of Birds of Mexico. And we, have, we started with um, institutions that would provide us with their data sets. And then we would, this was you know, 1990, so there were only about four or five that were computerized. And then we would go to the collection and verify the data set. Um, then we moved on to a bunch of institutions where we captured their data. In fact, of the 80 plus institutions that are included in this data set, for 32 of them, we did all of the capture of all of their data. And I'm not supposed to say this sort of thing on film, but I will. Um, the British Museum, which is the largest collection in the world, more than a million bird specimens, we computerized 15,000 Mexican bird specimens from their collection. And last I heard, that was their progress in digital capture of the data associated with their collection. <coughs> uh, now, maybe they've added something since, but, but uh, for a long time, their computer catalog of their collection was our 15,000 records that we captured and gave back to them. Uh, so 32 museums in which we did all of the capture, and then another 40, 50 collections where we either verified or uh, used uh, digital data. But we're now above 400,000 specimens for the country. Um, and you can see there's a pretty amazing density of records. There's still some holes. This is the Chihuahuan Desert and the deserts of the Baja, Cal of the Baja Peninsula and some areas in the interior um, in very remote areas. But really, this is a data set from which we've derived you know, dozens of publications because it's so rich and it's so comprehensive. So it is very possible to um, develop these summaries. And so you can, you can do plots through time, like Arturo showed you yesterday. In the case of Mexico, notice that the Second World War didn't make a big difference. Anybody know what this is? <coughs> it is the First World War, but that's not why Mexico had zero collecting those years. That's the Mexican, uh, uh, what was the Mexican Revolution? Yeah, the Mexican Revolution. The end of the Maximilian, right? Uh, no, Maximilian, Maximilian was 1860s. Uh, with, yeah. So Mexico had kind of a feudal system where there were huge landowners. And in 1919, uh, let's say the, the 19 teens, 
you had a massive popular uprising that basically removed, you know, the, the phrase was, the land belongs to those who work it. Um, yes, exactly, Emiliano Zapata. Um, so you, you see those, those historical things, you can see the accumulation of records through time. And right away, we get to our first gap, because we're gonna be talking about gaps a lot. But you can see right away that before 1850, we know almost nothing. In fact, my colleague and I, a few years ago, got to work on a new data set that had been lost since the 1780s. Um, and essentially, so that's over here, um, the Spanish royalty sent an expedition uh, in the 1780s. They collected all across Mexico and sent <coughs> specimens back, sent paintings back, and sent manuscripts back. And the ornithologists came with the collection and developed manuscripts. And then he died, Napoleon was invading across the continent, um, and the manuscript was lost. The specimens appear to have been destroyed, but the manuscript was lost, and eventually, in you know, 2002, I think it was, the manuscript was found not in the archives of the National Museum of Spain, but on the shelf with the books. And so, in order to get species accounts for 200 species that were in this lost manuscript, the terrible thing was that it was written in Latin. And so we had to go back, both of us, and relearn our Latin from high school in order to get those data out. But here's what Mexico looks like, and this is a Mexican bird data, that is. This is a pretty common reality. There's some small portion that's held in Mexican collections. You see, I've used the colors of the Mexican flag, obviously. But then three quarters of the data are held in institutions around the world, okay? So if you want a complete picture of the specimen record of your country, you not only have to work in the National Museum or the, the university collections, but you also then have to track down where have all those foreign collections gone. Now here in Africa, you may get a slightly narrower set of possibilities because of colonial heritage. You know, if we're talking Benin, we know that we've got to look principally in France. There are probably Beninese collections elsewhere, but we know the biggest one. In Italy. In Italy. Huh. Okay. So, um, this is a big challenge to getting a complete picture of um, a taxon for a region based on specimens, which is to say it is a highly dispersed and distributed data resource. And projects like VertNet and GBIF help. But if you know, this museum has not gotten around to digital capture and sharing of its data, then you're missing 10% of the data. So you're very vulnerable to dead institutions, lazy institutions, uh, selfish institutions. You know, your, your data depend on people that you don't know and, the people, and on people whom, who might not really share the same goals that you have. So again, I consider the specimens to be kind of the ultimate resource but not necessarily the easiest, okay? And that's not to mention all of the complications that you will have in harmonizing the data across all of these institutions. For the Mexican project, basically two or three of us visited all of those collections and checked and checked and checked all of the specimens, which took a lot of time. So a second 
A second resource are monographs. And this is an interesting one. Um, sometimes there exists a very detailed monograph that really compiles the state of knowledge as of some point in time. So I, I grabbed this monograph mainly because it's open access and I could get to it and also because it's next door to us. Um, as of 1932, the American Museum of Natural History had a big program in uh, the DRC um, and this, this man Chapin um, did or, or directed a lot of the work and assembled this monograph and I knew of the monograph I've never really worked in the Congo so I didn't I hadn't gotten into it and I was a little disappointed in its content because you get things like this you know um, very very useful compilation of Chapin's understanding of the history and so you know okay I need to figure out where um, this set of collections are and this set of collections and this um, 